Hey there! In my last video, I spoke about the importance of IMDb Pro and why working actors need a membership. I shared my personal profile and I spoke about the best ways to set it up, to set up your profile that would leave a lasting impression. And today, I was invited to a panel discussion hosted by IMDb and the CSA, the Casting Society of America, at Culver Studios here in LA, where notable casting directors Carla Hu, Jill Anthony Thomas, Seth Yankovitz, and Zohar Gazazian discussed how technology and today production landscape are reshaping casting and they talked about the best ways to optimize your IMDB Pro which I was really proud to hear them share my sentiments on setting up your profile although I took a deeper dive so you may want to watch this video as well but their their conversations shared some great insights on how they approach diversity today that's much more authentic than before and the, they also shared a few interesting personal shares on some of the shows and the films that they cast. So I'm going to take you with me. I arrived a few minutes late. I got a lot of great co uh, coverage and a lot of great content, a lot of great information. So let's dive into it, shall we? Um, you know, look, I, I, I always say like when I teach at a university or to young actors, it's like at an acting school, you just have to be working at it, honing your craft, studying. Um, obviously, actors today have an outlet, the World Wide Web, where you can make stuff and put it out there and people like us can find it as opposed to even a decade ago or 15 years ago, like we just didn't search on the internet for people, right? And now we have to almost, it's expected of us. Um, you know, Ellie gets a bad rap for theater and that's not true. Um, so I stress and urge everyone to get into theater here. Um, you know, we do all go and we do hunt. I mean, I went and saw Frankenstein's dinner party last week because a friend was in it and whether I think it was great or not does not matter <laughs> but I now know six or seven other actors that I wouldn't have necessarily do you know what I mean because we are able to see the talent come through what other factors may be in play so I urge you all to really tap into the resources you know here and the final thing and then I'll be quiet is that I always say is like you now have people to make product with, you know, content. And so start to meet people and just start writing and shooting and making. And it, it, it will come to us somehow. Yeah, I'm sure that's true for all of you as well. I'm hearing theater, doing live performance, I'm hearing doing digital content. Uh, any experiences like that where you found someone online or uh, any other places you've been looking lately that uh, you want to encourage people to look? I mean, we're always looking. I don't ever watch anything where I'm not working, right? So I see actors short films. I see actors on other people's reels. I see, you know, as I'm watching, they're like, ooh. You know, and then I go figure out who that is. It's just like, it's just, I go to the theater. I go to the studio here. I go to the theater in New York. I, you know, there's theater in San Diego. There's, there's Chicago. Like, there's lo loads of places where we find actors. So, work that gets work, just keep at it. Yeah, I love to hear that. I think that's really encouraging to know you, you are out there watching them. And, so. and it just it always seems like someone is all of a sudden very famous and like they just started yesterday and now they're very famous. But many of those actors have been grinding at it for a long, long time. Yeah. You know, Pedro Pascal was reading for guest stars for a long, long time and he was lo as lovely then as he is now. But like now he's a mega star, but that didn't happen overnight. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Spot on. Um, a few of you have talked about uh, worldwide casting and really looking beyond just the immediate LA community. One of the reasons that's possible, I think, is the rise in self taping. Uh, there are obviously pros and cons in that process. I'm curious for actors who want to make an impression on you in a self tape, but they're not in the room with you. What are some things you've seen that really impressed you, that stuck with you, that made you want to keep them in your role with it? Carla, anybody come to mind? Sure. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, self-tapes, 
I like them to be simple, really, because I've had all sorts of self dates. I've had like little jokes on set, you know, where the scene is in a bar and they're actually in a bar with music and no lighting. <laughs> um, so I would just say do your best, you know, do just do your best scene and, 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 and send it and it's going to come through. It does. You know, I know actors get very nervous about self-tapes, but I think it actually has a lot of pros because it gives you the opportunity to do it several times and choose the one you feel the most comfortable with versus going into the room and, you know, maybe having one take, being nervous, and then walking out and being like, I didn't, you know. Um, and also what you said, worldwide, it, it gives us the opportunity to see thousands of actors versus, you know, the only ones, that, the amount of actors we can fit into the, our schedule to come in and read. So. And I know, I'm sure those preferences are, are pretty wide as well. I mean, I'm sure at the core, what you're saying is true for everyone. Do your best work that you can and submit that. But also the scale of how complicated it needs to be. If anyone else wants to share to your experience with that. I think the most important thing is that we can hear you and see you. So it doesn't really matter what's behind you. Um, it, 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 I mean, if you can, okay, if you can, but even a cream-colored wall will not ruin your self-tape if you're wonderful. You don't have to worry about like purchasing this fabulous curtain. You know what I mean? If you can, try something that's not busy behind you. But that's pretty much it. Six ninety nine on Amazon, you can get a blue sheet. A blue sheet. Um, but yeah, like medium close-up. Sometimes people send us tapes like that are like this wide, you can't see what's going on here. This is, this is film and television, it's a medium of the close up. But you, you also don't want, right? So it's just about that, like the simplicity of that. And then it does, and this is the hardest part, which I understand that actors have communicated difficulty in this. It's the importance of a reader so who's not important. going to slow you down, who's not going to distract. Um, so I think if you find yourself in a situation where you've been asked for an audition and you can't secure somebody, you should reach out to the casting office and say, I can't find a reader. Is there any way that you can Zoom with me or someone in your office can read something to assist me with that? Because I think I certainly am open to that and I understand that. And I think that is an important component of the success of a self-tape. Yeah, like your little brother, your grandmother, your mom, your voice pre-recorded as the other part. Please don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I, 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 I know you think it's clever or it will be cute or it's a little kid in the script that you're playing off of. It, it doesn't translate in a self-tape. And if you are getting 400 self-tapes for a role, which is amazing for actors, right? Actors that wouldn't necessarily have been brought in because we have to move fast or in the old system like... It just we didn't go that deep. Like you, you have to keep it simple and clean and clear and watchable, right? And because if we're sharing it, like you don't know how busy the producer is or the studio network, and like we, you just got to keep it clean and clear. And sticking to the lines as scripted for in most cases, um, I do comedy primarily. And there is a rhythm to comedy and the beats and the timing. And a lot of people want to improvise or add stuff. You could do one take like that, but don't do that on both takes because I we can't edit that all out before we send it to the producer. <laughs> that's yeah, that's helpful. Thanks for getting in the weeds on it. I, I do think actors really don't know what you're exactly looking for sometimes. And so that, that's really, really helpful to hear. But you don't need like fabulous production value. You don't no. need to go to a studio. There's other departments for that. Yeah. And don't have your reader in the shot. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to break this down really hard right now. Okay? It's, great. it's great. And like Gohar said, if you're not comfortable self-taping, jump on a Zoom with us. Yeah, yeah we, we offer. We make time. We offer Please make the ask. <laughs> I'm always surprised at how when we put that out, if you're not, you know, we're setting aside this time for people who would prefer to Zoom. I'm surprised every time at how few people take us up on it. And we give feedback and we adjust the performance. It's just surprising to me how few people take, take us up. Yeah, wow. You know, it's funny, but I actually end up asking them to tape afterwards. <laughs> because the quality is just not as good for some reason. Yes, yeah. the quality is not as good when, you, when, when 
when we do the you know the Zoom sessions with the actors, always the self tapes the quality is better to share. Right. Yeah, that's a good reminder too. I think no, right on because I think you know for actors they're thinking about uh, their agent passing it to you. They might not be thinking about everyone down the line who needs to see that tape too. So so it is useful to hear that. Um, when you are out there online looking for folks, as you've talked about doing, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what you hope to find on someone's Instagram page, their website, their IMDb Pro page. When you land there, what makes your life easier? What, what are you looking for? Um, well, on IMDb, uh, first of all, a headshot, which it's amazing, but when you're doing like big searches, worldwide searches, sometimes actors don't have headshots. Second, their contact info. That's super important because a lot of international actors don't have contact info, and a lot of actors don't have contact info, right? Um, those would be the two main things to have. And then, of course, all your credits and your... You know, I, think demo reels. <coughs> I think on the IMDb Pro, it's, uh, I'm pretty sure you can watch clips. And, and honestly... Um, it's really helpful because it's like one less place we have to go to. Like, because we, go ahead. if we're on IMDb, like trying to memorize your resume so we could talk intelligently to our producers about you, like, I, if we can watch something or we could just bring it up versus like, then we have to go to a breakdown and then find your, or go find your agent's email. Like, I, I, I think it's like wonderful to have like great, concise clips on IMDb Pro. I, that's my favorite part. Is, I love that too. And if you don't have a lot of the, you know theatrical credits, it can be self-created content. Just something so that we can see you doing what you do. And also, I wanted to say regarding headshots, please, sometimes people have really old ones on there. <laughs> and then they come in for an audition and it's a decade, and it's a decade later. So I, I like to see a variety of looks. You can keep ones from when you were younger if it was something cool that you were working on. But I, I definitely like to see more than one picture and and a current picture. Yeah, and something that, I don't know, a photo that captures your essence. I don't know how to say it. Some people have like a photo that's not really who they are, you know? It's not well, we way. get into the whole headshot thing. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it's not your way. It's okay for it to capture who you are because at the end of the day, that's what's going to get you the match with the role. Right. Right. Right, right. Not necessarily the most model photo. Correct. The, the one that captures Correct. you. Correct. Not yeah. like the Lamazon photo. <laughs> you. <laughs> um, I use one last question in that area because you mentioned clips, Seth. Are we in a place now where clips are the primary as opposed to a reel, as opposed to what's most interesting to you? I mean, no, 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 no. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll D all the above. Like, yeah. I think clips are. Um, you know, look, sometimes we're sitting in a room with our producers and we can, like, go on and just, like, show them a clip, right? But I think a reel is still very impactful for us educating our producers. Um, you would be shocked how uncreative very high-end creatives are. And so we have to, in casting, spoon-feed people <laughs> information. And so I, I, I think reels are important. And, and I, I was just saying this the other night, like, I'm a big fan of, like, this is my comedy reel and this is my drama reel so that I don't have to, like, fish through your Law & Order SVU <laughs> to get to, you know, two broke girls. I mean, uh, you know, I do a lot of comedy like Jill, so oftentimes it's great to see the other stuff, but, like, I need to just get to the point. And so, yeah. No, I'm a big... I, 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 I'm a big real person. <clears throat> um, Again, it's the way, especially as an ex-executive, it's the way we got people hired. Like, I, I, I've gotten auditions, like, from Canada or other places, and it's not a great audition, but, like, I know this actor is a good actor, and I'm like, ugh, I'm not going to make you, the casting director, go through the process of re-auditioning them. Can you just get me a reel? Because then I can show everyone, like, they can act. So it's very, very helpful for us to yeah, that's so helpful to know. Thank you for sharing that. Um, as authenticity is increasingly embraced in casting, and we've been talking about that in, in a variety of ways, um, I'd love to hear uh, any recent examples where you expanded your casting pool because of a call for or, or your own interest in exploring 
options that expanded the consideration for gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, um, race or ethnicity. Jill, maybe uh, ask yourself. Well, in the last six years, I've had the pleasure uh, to cast three different lead roles in three different projects that were written for a neurodivergent actor. So, yeah, so that was a fascinating process. I learned a lot, and we had to look far and wide from Google searches to Instagram to calling Autism Speaks or the different organizations, um, Facebook groups, theaters that uh, focused on neurodivergent talent. Uh, so it was really fascinating process. And yeah. Um, <clears throat> about a year ago, I did a pilot and then the series uh, called Deli Boys, which hasn't come out yet. And for that was an entire Pakistani cast with one North Indian. Um, but I had to educate myself on Pakistani and Indian history and the war and culture and really, you know, um, push back on actors that were like, but I'm, and I was like, no, no, you're not Pakistani, you know, which I get because <clears throat> for so long, <clears throat> excuse me, we put like everybody into like this one sort of bubble and it's like no longer, like we now have to truly be authentic which I think is like amazing, right? It's stunning that we, we now, I mean, casting directors were at the forefront of diversity, casting differently. It used to be like the big win was if you could get a, a, a female for a male role and we were like, we did it, you know? But I just, I just um, yeah, it's pretty exceptional what's happening. Um, I've been so, oh. no, no, you go, go, go ahead. Um, I've been so fortunate a number of times to be able to cast actors who are deaf or hard of hearing and that was a fascinating uh, experience I learned so much about that community which I'm so grateful for um, you know we uh, we worked very closely in terms of outreach with Deaf West Theater the people they're amazing um, they help us so much with outreach I mean like we put Lauren Ridloff on The Walking Dead a beautiful ongoing role and then I recently actually cast a short film that was about police violence and the leads were two young black boys, one of whom was deaf and one of whom was his brother who was fluent in ASL. So we had to do this entire search where Deaf West was so helpful to us and we did auditions and we worked very closely with interpreters. You know, it's a whole process. And um, we ended up finding this little boy, Kevon Woodard, and he had done nothing. And uh, our director fell in love with him, and then we pushed our dates a little bit, and then he went and booked The Last of Us and got yeah. it and shot that, and then he came and shot our short, and then he got nominated for an Emmy. Yeah. And he was like nine or eight years old, raw, had never acted before, like, and his mother was incredible, and it was such a, you know, it was just such a beautiful thing, and we were like, oh, oh my God, because there's opportunities now for people, and like, you know, it's not all the kids who are represented in town. You have to go and really find people and you have to do it using resources that are trusted by that community. You know, you can't just go on, yeah, you have to like work with people who are in that community, who can do outreach to the families. And, and so it's a beautiful thing. And you learn so much about a community that you know exists, but you don't know intimately. So I think it's a gift. Um, for me, while well, being Mexican, uh, when I moved to L.A., which was 17 years ago, <laughs> um, there was no interest in authenticity at all. And I remember uh, that producers would be like, yeah, we want to cast this actor. I would be like, no, but he's Puerto Rican. He can't do Mexican. Because he's not Mexican. He speaks like Puerto Rican. You know, and it's been a, it's been a long fight in, in, in fighting for authenticity and um also educating people about, you know, the Latino world is very, very diverse. And it's been just put into one little box of everyone looks this way and everyone is from Mexico. <laughs> because no, you know, it's 32 countries. <laughs> Not everyone's Mexican. So I've, th that's, been, that's been my career here, fighting for authenticity and um, diversity, representation.
Yeah. I, I'm sure you had to engage with that in a very direct way with Amelia Perez, not only uh, with ethnicity and race, but also uh, trans issues as well. Um, how was that experience and at casting and working with the whole team? Yes, well, that was um, that was challenging. We looked everywhere, and then you come into the little nuances of you know the accent. And for example, Emilia Perez, um, the characters were actually Mexican, right? And none of them are actually Mexican <laughs> of the actors, which is challenging for me in in in, in a way, but. Um, in this case, I did talk to Jack and I said, okay, well, Selena is great and it's gr she's great for this role, but you need to put into the story somewhere that she's not actually from Mexico because her Spanish is just not right. You know, her Spanish is not there and definitely not Mexican, not, not native. Um, and then Zoe, well, she can't be Mexican either. She's, she's Dominican and she doesn't look Mexican and her accent was there. So you also need to put into the story something in there to 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 make you know because it needs to be real. Otherwise, all the Latino community is like, what what are you doing? Um, and then for Carlos Sofia, and on top of it, we had to find people who could sing. <laughs> Not only you know, um, for the role of of Emilia, trans, right, and to be able to play both both roles, the two roles and. So that was a big, big search um, and just trying to also educate because Jack doesn't speak Spanish or English and, you know, the, uh, but trying to uh, say, you know, you can, we can go this way, but we need to adjust it in the story. And it was great with him because he was, he's a very generous person. I've never worked with a director like that. Um, and he actually addressed all those things. Yeah. That's so interesting. Thanks for sharing that. And it's so interesting to hear all your experiences where what you're learning in your casting experience, you're bringing back to the producers, you're bringing back to the creative team, they're making adjustments around that. I think that's really exciting. Yeah, and it's just changed dramatically, as everyone's pointing out. Like, when I was an assistant and I came in, and the conversations were so different, and I'm Armenian and I'm an immigrant, and so I had a very, like, a sensitivity to the people of the Middle East not being a monolith. And, you know, I remember I would come in and to the waiting room because there'd be a lot of offices kind of, you know, we would share a waiting room. And they would be reading, like, some co small role that was, like, Arab man number two. And, like, half of them were Armenian, and half of them were Iranian. I was like, what's happening, you know? And so, the, and people didn't even want to have those conversations. Like, this, these, this, like, he can't play this character because he has, a, he has a thick Iranian accent. And so now everyone really, I feel like, wants to know and wants to honor that and wants to see that. And so it's nice to not be fighting so hard without <laughs> seeing a change. Like there's an openness now to all these things. That's great to hear. Yeah. And, and I'll remind on behalf of IMDb Pro as well to make sure you're updating your personal details on your IMDb <laughs> Pro page so they can search for you if they're looking for you. Uh, for a that, role. Is, that is actually very important because yeah. sometimes, because I do a lot of diversity and sometimes I put in there uh, ethnicity and actors don't put their ethnicities there. And I know they don't want to be boxed into a specific, which is also hard because, you know, you don't want to get into, but, but then also it doesn't allow us to be able to find you if we are looking for something specific. I, I have to say, like, don't be scared anymore about that, right? Like, if you are white presenting, then you can fill that character as well. And if you're white presenting, but half Latin, like, it's a bonus as well. Like, there's so much intricate detail to what we get to do now that I, I feel like it's almost like, you know, you, you absolutely should put everything that you sort of identify as. Um, and then leave it to us to really <clears throat> sort of take it and run with it and be able to sell you because you 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 might not you you might be like well I don't and then I'm not gonna and it's like no no it's actually gonna help you and help us get you the job so I, I agree I think you're 100 percent there yeah yeah it's right on to acknowledge that there was fear before in some yes ways. Yeah. Well, there still is yeah. you know I understand because you can be you can be boxed into you know you're just Latino you're just Middle Eastern or you can only play that. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that's totally fair. Uh, I want to talk about maintaining connections with actors, particularly in a self-tape world, but uh, look, no one wants to be annoying, right? No one wants to be bugging you guys, but how have you seen actors successfully maintain a connection with you and, and stay in your world? Uh, um, <laughs> has no one. I'll do it. I'll take it on. It's okay. Um, I've had experiences where actors who I reading, you know, will send me a message that say, say like, "Oh, I'm taping for you. Thank you for this. We met on such and such," and you know, just like a reminder, which I think is is nice and lovely. And I think that you absolutely, if you have someone's direct contact, if or if you if you want your representative to do it for you, if you have if you're in that situation, that they should send. You can send people updates. Just do it sparingly, and when there's a meaningful update, you know, so you're not constantly, you know, messaging them because we just we just have such an influx of communication that it just is hard to get through it all. But if you do it sparingly when you have some meaningful update, I think I, I like getting those kinds of messages from actors I've met and seeing what they're up to. And I think that's lovely. It used to be postcards. Yeah. I'm glad there are no more postcards. I know. I used to. I the amount like, of trees. My old casting partner, Jewel Bestrop, had a box full of postcards and I'd be like, I hate them. And then I was like doing episodic and I was like, can I borrow that box of postcards you have? Uh, look, I think it's like, it's like what Gohar said. If you're doing something great, if you're really proud of something, if you just got a lead in a show, if you just got a huge guest star, if you just got an art, just send an email. Guess what? We can either read it or not, right? But this is, I mean, I hate to say this, but it's show business for a reason, right? And you are your CEO and you have to sell yourself. And if you're not going to do it and you're the best sort of proponent for yourselves, well, no one else is going to. So we're only going to hear about it if you tell us. Yeah, I would also say that, you know, if you find out that a casting director is casting a certain role that you you feel like you fit, do send an email. Because it, 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 we do get a lot of emails, like a lot. We can't get to all of them. And don't feel bad if we don't answer because we just don't have the time. But sometimes I've received an email where I'm precisely looking for that type of actor and the email comes in right at the perfect moment you know so just stay up to date on what casting directors are doing what projects are out there what roles and you know you never know you might be lucky and, and hit the right moment yeah yeah I'm sure there's not a consistent answer to this but to that point of if you are track, if you're an actor and you're tracking the news cycle, you're on IMDb Pro, you're reading all the latest articles about a project coming out. Is there a stage in that process where you find you are more receptive to messages from agents and where people are trying to get to you? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like when you start the project, it is a feeding frenzy. <laughs> uh, thousands and thousands of submissions lists of known talent that the network wants a name or who, who are the known entities that are right for this and checking avails and agents pitching. And I always feel like that first week is a little overwhelming where it were in the weeds. So I think more for the discovery phase around week three, I mean, like if it's a pilot, you know, like we're doing six, six week search or something, the middle <laughs> episodic, you have to move fast. If you see something you like, send an email and it, every week I, take someone out of my emails and try to give them an audition for something, so, yeah. Wow. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it used to be the postcard game. We would collect all the postcards, and the script would come out, and we'd go through the postcards, and we'd go, which person are we going to pick for an audition? And that doesn't happen anymore, so now it is in my work email account in a folder. So I put them in the folder. Aw, thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I want to... Rewind to some of those favorite all-time projects you talked about, or, or memorable all-time projects. I won't make you call one a favorite and, and others not. <laughs> I want to hear some stories from those projects. So uh, I'll start. Gohar, you were... Remind me which ones you, you told us about. You said... Walking Dead. Walking Dead. Yeah. And uh, Jewel. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about Julia, because I think that's a really lovely show. Any casting moments that stay with you from it? Well, um... God, that cat, it got shot in Boston, so we were trying to cast a lot of actors out of New York, which is my dream. 
Um, it was all these wonderful theater people. And um, Sarah Lancashire, who obviously is a very well-known and very well-regarded actor in the UK that Americans do not know, unless they watched Happy Valley. Um, you know, there was very few people who could play Julia Child. And um, it was a short list. <laughs> and we were reading some people, and she and we loved, we sat, we got on the idea and loved the idea, and she was lovely enough to agree to fly out here and, you know, show her take on the characters. And she really taught us so specifically the physicality and the mannerisms. And that was a real privilege and a pleasure, and we were so fortunate to cast her. Um, and, you know, a lot of those people we, it was like Phoebe knew, you know, we, a lot of those were offers to just incredible people. But um, Brittany Bradford, who we were looking for a woman to play the producer, and the real woman actually was a white woman. So there was a lot of ongoing conversations because the show took place in the 50s and it was a highly, it was a television production in the 50s. It was highly male and highly white. And the creatives made a choice to make that character a black woman regardless of the fact that that wasn't true because we felt that there, it was important uh, to, talk, to tell a story, of a, an aspirational story of a, a black woman artist trying to make it in television in the 50s. And Brittany Bradford read for it among a number of women. She had just graduated Juilliard. She had barely done anything. They saw her and they were like, that's it. That doesn't happen a lot. There's a lot of putting actors through the ringer, you know. But oh, I'm not, I should probably have this higher. But um, you know, they fell in love with her, and, and she was lovely. And um, that that show was like all the loveliest people in the world in the cast, and also in the in the crew and all the people. It was just like the loveliest experience. So yeah. And then you know, I guess not positive. I mean, not positive. Positive. It was very hard to cast Donald Trump in the Comey role. Sure. Really hard. Actors didn't want to do it. Um, understandably, uh, and Brendan Gleeson passed, oh. and then we made a Hail Mary circle back to him, and made our pitch, and he agreed to do it, but he said no press. And I think that it took an actor who wasn't American sure. <laughs> to agree to take that on, because there was a real sense of like, uh, yeah. what's going to be the response? Yeah. So that was an interesting, it was, that was a very interesting process because it was all real people and contemporary real people. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting to hear you talk about New York theater actors too and them holding a special place in your heart as well. Yes, and then we would get, okay, just short, sorry guys. Sure. We would, they, so we would cast like Jefferson Mays and all these fabulous people and then we would get like videos from the set where he would like, they would, they did a number. <laughs> they did a whole number and Jefferson Mays was singing and like it was a whole to do and we would get these videos and it was just like the best thing ever because um, that community is very close knit um, so that was I love getting reports from the set after an actor shoots something if they have a good experience I love when they send me yes. uh, photos with the cast or a little note telling me about their experience I love that FYI that's a great way to do that stay in do contact. it um, yeah, before we probably about five minutes before I open up the room for some Q and A's, but I'd love to hear some other personal favorites. I mean, Seth, you mentioned The Hangover, a favorite um, for sure. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. I mean, oh, I go for my favorite thing just was sort of the process of Max Greenfield on New Girl, um, <clears throat> because Elizabeth Merriweather and the writers were very big comedy snobs, and they knew <laughs> everyone, and like. Like, they wanted to, like, pre-read all my lists and, like, had to have... And I knew Max really from around town, less as an, uh, from auditioning him, more just socially. And so I snuck him into my second producer session. It literally snuck him in. Like, name not on the list. and was oh like, my oh, my God. Like, I forgot <laughs> to put this person's name on my list. And, and he came in and Jake... Jake Kasdan, who was not in the room, so we sent the tape that night, like, sent a message and was just like, oh, my God, he's amazing. <laughs> no, no. And so, like, that's sort of how it, like, I mean, he obviously, like, came back and tested and, you know, read with Zoe. But, but like, th those moments of, like, true pride where, you know, we get to be creative and we get to sort of, like, do our thing and, um, you know, the magic of, like, that ensemble, sort of. And he knew Jake prior, too, is that right? Jake, uh... No. Uh, not 
I mean, not that I'm aware of. Not Jake has. I'm sorry. Oh, Jake no, uh, Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. I mean, oh. I don't. I don't think they knew each okay. other. J- I mean, maybe they. Maybe did. an apocryphal I story. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah. Um, Jake was Jake Johnson was just sort of kind of coming up right at that moment where Justin yeah. was really big. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Jill and Carla. Uh, Jill, if you'd love to, anything you'd like to share? Are we talking about like people that were? I suppose. Yeah, I'm only passing that just really stick um, with you. That. I'll do the one that's a flex for my daughter because she loves this one. So like in 2012, I was casting a project for Disney and I needed to find young talent around, you know, 11 to 13 years old that could sing, act, the whole shebang. And a tape came to me from Pennsylvania of a 12 year old girl that blew me away. I got goosebumps. Uh, She ended up getting the part on the pilot. It didn't go anywhere, but she's doing just fine because her name is Sabrina Carpenter. (laughs) But I found her, like, off of a nationwide search. She didn't have an agent. She didn't have a manager. Her dad was, like, putting YouTube videos up for her, and they somehow saw the casting notice. I think through Nancy Carly uh, told her about it. She's her aunt. And she sent me the stuff, and I, yeah, that was one moment where I just went, this girl is going to be a star. Wow, that's good. Um, let me see. Well, one thing that my, you know, uh, Coco, for example, the boy, um, I actually knew him from a short film that I had cast recently, right before uh, I started casting this. And I knew he was perfect and he was the boy, right? But of course, we had to go and look for he came in in the first session. I sent him in the first tape to producers, to everyone. And I knew he was the one. But still, we had to go and look at 5,000 5, other kids everywhere. We flew to Mexico. We won every, I mean, we did <laughs> crazy. And then we ended up going back to him. So also, in a way, you know, I know sometimes it, it's, it's hard and patient because you're waiting to hear from from a project whether you're going to, you know, get a call back or what's going on. Sometimes that happens. You know, where you auditioned and three months later they come back to you and, and, and give you the, the role. Yeah, you really um, will hear back. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks for sharing those. Uh, yeah, we do have time for probably two audience questions or so. Um, yeah, uh, Karen will come to you with a microphone. She's finding someone right there. Hi, I'm Deborah Morris. It's nice to meet all of you. I enjoyed it. I wanted to know, I know you take emails, but I was wondering if you ever take anything on on LinkedIn. You know, if you ever open your messages up at LinkedIn and look for thank yous. And I know I use it for projects that I've been cast on and I thank people. And I just wondered if LinkedIn was something that I don't use LinkedIn. I don't either. I'm scared of it. I feel like it's telling everyone I want a real nine to five. (laughs) (laughs) I don't, I don't understand LinkedIn. I don't either. I don't don't use it. I don't get it. I'm good. (laughs) Thanks for asking. Yeah. That's a good question. Oh, Karen, you look like you got something. Hi there, uh, Scott Perry. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, As the landscape changes from the broadcasters to the streamers, Who's holding the card now for the final decision on the casting? Is it still the network and the suits, or is it more the creatives, like the showrunner, the director, the producers? I would say it's still the, the, the studios. I mean, the creatives have a lot to say, but I would say it's still. Network. I think every scenario is different, and each of the streamers works in a different way. For instance, on one, like, yes, the executives want to approve the choices, but they, in some cases, really let the showrunners have their say, and they don't push back if the showrunner's passionate. And then in other scenarios, you have to go through the whole process, and and there is more influence from the executives. Yeah, it also depends on the, the level of showrunner. You know, yeah. if it's someone, uh, you know, very experienced and uh, big name, they're less likely to push back on them than, like, younger people. But it's a... It's a process. Your showrunners, you still are, they're making choices that we're presenting to the studio network, and the studio network have to sign off on those people, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. I think we have time for one more. Karen, you got one? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, so I'm really interested in doing multicam comedy, but yeah, so to, to keep my, uh, my, my comedy chops up, I do a lot of stand-up, but I've noticed there's a really severe difference between watching a tape of a stand-up comedian versus being in the room when the show's actually happening. And I'm just wondering if you've thought about how that relates to actors auditioning for multicam using self-tapes versus being in the room and, and seeing how they affect a, a real live audience, because that's so important to making a multicam work. Yeah, absolutely. For multicam, I, I don't want self-tapes and Zooms. I want to be in the room with people. I mean, that's not to say that in the initial rounds, we won't start with self-tape. But when you start to get serious about making choices, it's crucial that it's in person. Um, timing, the energy. Yeah, absolutely. Multicam is a different animal. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I think one more. We got, we got time. Let's <laughs> grab one more. Hi, guys. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the process post-initial self-tape between co-star, guest star, and series regular? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so after the self-tape, <clears throat> right, the casting directors are watching, and some of us probably give feedback before and maybe ask for, like, another tape. Some just send it along to their showrunner or producer to decide if they want a director session or a producer session. Once that happens, if it goes further, it would go to studio. The studio then would decide um, <clears throat> if they're going to put a test deal in place. Uh, and then it would go, then you'd retape. Maybe it'd be a chemistry read. And then it would go to network. Um, I, I've sort of done it all in terms of like, <clears throat> gotten a self-tape, thought it was bad, but was, like, obsessed with the actor, and I was like, please have them redo that, and here are some notes. Um, and I've also gotten self-tapes and been like, they're amazing, put a test deal in place right now, mm -hmm. and we have to chemistry read them with our lead, right? And you've got to move fast. So it really also depends, you know, when you're doing streaming, sometimes you have the luxury of a little more time than the old, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox pilot season, um, where it was like, okay, I like him, put, put a test deal and like get him in here tomorrow. Like you didn't have time to really like work it out. So um, I think that's the question you asked. Um, and the differences, right, between co-star and oh, sorry. recurring. Yes. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, and sometimes you don't need, I mean, we don't need approval from studio network. Sometimes not for those. Yeah, yeah we tend to cast most of our co-stars just off of self-tape, send, send choices to the producer and director, and they generally choose co-stars off. Guest stars more maybe bring someone on a Zoom with the producer. Or even just a Zoom with us. Sometimes if it's a new actor to me and I like their tape, but I want to know... Because it's a, like it's a really challenging guest star, or, or especially if it's a series regular, I'll do a Zoom with them where I meet them and we play around and I see how they take direction, which is hugely telling of a performer as well. Thank you. Thank, thank That's our time for now. Thank you so much for being so candid, so open. Uh, I'm being on the pro. Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, and. Uh, Stick around. We do have a networking opportunity afterwards. If you aren't an INDP Pro member, please join today and make sure you verify your SAG after membership. You get 30% off on your next billing cycle when you do that, if you didn't know. <laughs>have it that is great information straight from the mouths from some of the top casting directors i want to say in la but in the world in america and um you know i really found the panel really helpful there were some things that i learned myself so i hope that you enjoyed that video until next time oh you can check out my podcast acting lessons learned and listen if you need help setting up your imdb pro account you may want to watch this video where i get straight to the setup all right until next time bye bye